Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Mishgan Masumi, a fellow and lecturer in the Civic, Liberal and Global Education Program at Stanford University. And I'm also an affiliate of the Center for South Asia and the Abbasi Program in Islamic Studies, our generous sponsors of today's event. I would especially like to thank Dr. Lalita Duperon and Simrath Matharu from the Center of South Asia, as well as Dr. Farah El Sharif and Rula Khalid from the Abbasi program for their continued support of scholarship and engagement with Afghanistan related topics. Before I introduce our roundtable, I would like to acknowledge that Stanford sits on the ancestral land of the Muwekma Ohlone tribe. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone people. Consistent with our values of community and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge, honor, and make visible the university's relationship to Native peoples. And on the note of acknowledgement and inclusion, today's roundtable event brings together a diverse group of scholars to discuss various forms of violence that have made the status of diverse communities in Afghanistan more and more vulnerable by the day. Since the US withdrawal from Afghanistan in 2021, the Taliban takeover has precipitated a broad assault on Afghanistan society, giving way to an accelerating human rights and humanitarian crisis. In addition to the immediate rollback on women's rights, the Taliban have engaged in persecuting members of specific ethnic and religious communities, including Hazaras, Tajiks, Uzbeks, and others. This has produced some robust online activism with hashtag campaigns to stop genocide, to stop atrocities, to let women learn and go to school. Our hope for today's roundtable is to analyze the origins and effects of this violence and explore their disastrous consequences for the diverse communities that make up the political landscape of Afghanistan. Moreover, as many citizens of Afghanistan have become overnight refugees in mass and asylum seekers around the world, their futures are in limbo, waiting to hear if they'll be the lucky recipients of a more permanent residential status. How do we figure in this dilemma for those citizens whose gender, ethnicity, or religion are under threat in their country of origin? Where do they go? On a somewhat slightly personal note, I have to confess that as a scholar of Afghanistan, part of the impetus for hosting this event has to do with conversations I had with Professor Robert Cruz on how we can make sense of this current climate. As scholars of history, we reference the past to sometimes help us make sense of the present. And perhaps there are some lessons there, but as the tides are turning quickly, so too does the course of history. I'm also a student of sound and music and poetry figure prominently in my work and often gives me respite to the unavoidable chaos of life and our world. And I couldn't think of a more appropriate way to prelude an introduction to Professor Cruz, who will also introduce our esteemed panelists, than to begin with just a couple lines of poetry. <laughs> The cage remains bloodstained as long as the song of freedom is sung. The mountain valleys shall tremble until freedom soars. These words belong to Qahar Asi, whose name, whose name translates to angry rebel, a renowned contemporary poet from Afghanistan who was born in 1956 in a small village in Panjshir and was unfortunately killed by a rocket in Kabul in 1994. Unbeknownst to him, his words were prophetic, resonating with the sign of his times, as well as ours. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Cruz. Professor Robert Cruz is a historian whose research and teaching interests focus on Afghanistan, Central and South Asia, Russia, Islam, and global history. His prophylic a prophylic portfolio includes a number of important books on Afghanistan. He is the author of Afghan Modern, The History of a Global Nation, and co-editor of Under the Drones, Modern Lives in the Afghanistan-Pakistan Borderlands, and The Taliban and the Crisis of Afghanistan. His work has also appeared in Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy, The New York Times, and The Washington Post. Professor Cruz is currently editor-in-chief of the journal Afghanistan, which is the journal of the American Institute of Afghanistan Studies and published through Edinburgh University Press. 
and he is the CFO of the Institute for New Global Politics. Professor Cruz, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Masumi. Um, thank you for, for the very lovely and um, overdone introduction. Thank you, <laughs> my part at least, but the poetry was beautiful. And, and thank you um, for organizing us and really, I think, providing us with the intellectual impetus for making this happen. So I think um, all of us who will learn from our distinguished panel today will be primarily in your debt for, for getting us moving in this important direction and really um, being the force behind all things related to Afghanistan at Stanford, um, as, as well as our other colleagues. Thank you, everyone at the Center for South Asia and the Abbasi Program in Islamic Studies. So again, um, it's special to have colleagues who are helping us respond to something that is, that is ongoing, that is timely. Um, we're still trying to make sense of all this, and we have wonderful support here to um, have a forum like this at short notice um, for a, a global audience. So thank you all, and especially Dr. Masumi, whose own book, uh, I highly recommend, I must plug now, in progress, uh, the first scholar to study Afghan sound and music. So um, we are in her debt uh, for that as well. So thank you so much, Dr. Masumi. Um, so I have the, the great privilege of um, not only wearing a tie for the special occasion, once a year at least, given our guests, I have to break it out. Um, I have the special privilege of, of introducing our most distinguished experts who uh, are gonna teach us today. Um, first, we will be um, grateful to introduce uh, Dr. Fulkunda Akbari, who's a postdoctoral research fellow at the Monash Gender, Peace and Security Center at Monash University in Australia. She has very generously woken up quite early this morning <laughs> to be with us today. So I think she gets the award for having come the furthest. Um, the, at Monash, she focuses on diplomatic negotiations with non-state uh, armed actors, peace processes in women, and peace and security in Afghanistan. I'm very much looking forward to reading her fresh PhD dissertation, which I hope I'm quoting correctly. I believe this title is Diplomatic Actors, Peace Settlements with Non-State Armed Actors, the Taliban in Afghanistan, and the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia. So congratulations on that, and we look forward to seeing that in book form very soon. Uh, she was a senior policy analyst at the Independent D Directorate of Local Governance for the former Afghan government and has worked at the Political Affairs Department uh, at the UN headquarters. She also worked with the Special Investigation Team of the Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission, which monitored, investigated, and reported on violations of international humanitarian law. She's also a, a well-known and respected uh, and vocal advocate for Afghanistan's Hazara community and for women's rights. We're also very fortunate to have uh, Mr. Mehdi J. Hakimi, who is the John Peters Humphrey Fellow at Harvard Law School. Um, he's also a Stanford veteran and colleague. Uh, here he served as the Executive Director of the Rule of Law Program and lecturer at Stanford Law School, and was also the former chair of the Law Department at the American University of Afghanistan. He has worked with various institutions on international development and human rights issues, including the Asia Foundation and Yale Law School. He has authored or co-authored multiple books on the laws and legal system of Afghanistan. His work has been translated into Farsi and Dari, and he currently serves as the editor for the Harvard International Law Journal. And we're most grateful to have his perspective and learning today. Um, our third panelist will be Nasir Adin Nizami, also known as Nasir, <laughs> so, uh, who's a, a new colleague at Stanford at the law school. Um, he's also chair of the law department at the American University of Afghanistan. He simultaneously holds non-residential research fellow status at the Information Society Law Center at the University of Milan. Um, he began his career as an assistant professor of law at Kabul University, where he served as vice dean for the faculty of law and political science. He holds an LLM from the University of Washington and an LLB from Kabul University. He uh, has served as a criminal justice consultant for the Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission, in addition to his lengthy career of legal scholarship and teaching. So it's wonderful to have him here at Stanford. Um, so Mushkan and I proposed um, a roundtable that we hope will be fairly open-ended and we'll conclude with some time for our guests online to post questions as well. But we thought we would lay out essentially three basic questions, starting from ground zero in effect, um, assuming that no one, none of our participants or rather not our participants, but our, our audience has any particular knowledge about what's happening today. So we're kind of starting as if, you know, it's a, a, it's a kind of blank slate. I know we have experts in the crowd too. I see the names. We have many, many scholars in attendance online, but just assuming an audience that, you know, isn't following things as closely as, as you are with your expertise. Um, and we'd like to offer you 
if we may, five to seven minutes to respond to each of our three kind of framing questions. And I think we'll go in the order of introduction, um, Dr. Akbari, uh, Mehdi Hakimi, and then Nasruddin Nazami in that order. Um, I have the honor of posing the first question, then we'll turn back to Dr. Masumi, and then I'll conclude with the third question, and then we will hopefully open the floor. Uh, so my question is the following, and each of you will have an opportunity to, to respond. And again, thank you in advance for sharing your time and, and expertise. So our first question, the Taliban seized power across Afghanistan in the summer of 2021, pledging to restore peace, order, and stability. They have proved unable or unwilling to fulfill these promises. Instead, the Taliban have unleashed and failed to prevent multiple waves of violence against specific targets who appear to have been chosen because of their ethnicity, religion, gender, and political opinion. How should we make sense of this very confusing, very opaque, very um, kind of kaleidoscopic landscape, which entails multiple forms of violence that seem to be unfolding simultaneously? Um, how can we make sense of this? And as this kind of secondary question, um, what effects is this violence having on Afghan society today? So Dr. Akbari, if we may have your perspective first, thank you in advance. Thank you very much, Professor Cruz, and also Dr. Masumi for, um, uh, for organizing today's webinar and the Center for South Asia and Abbasi program at Stanford University. And also um, good evening, afternoon, good morning to the audience, depending where in the world they are. Um, I'm very, very honored uh, to be on this panel today with my co-panelists. Uh, to answer uh, your question, uh, Dr. C uh, Professor Cruz, I think it's not surprising um, uh, to observe and see uh, what's happening in Afghanistan in this such a vague, uncertain, and different phases of violence that has been going on. The Taliban came to power through violence and force, a group whose characteristics are embedded in terrorism and want state power. Um, I think uh, we knew that we could not expect much more than what we are already um, uh, seeing today and what we have seen in the past is just a continuation of, of, of the Taliban regime and their rule. The Taliban have been around for almost three decades now and they have ruled Afghanistan before um, August 2021 that is in our fresh memory. We remember most of us the, the uh, 1990s the first Taliban rule or the so-called Taliban uh, one Point oh. um, and in their first uh, rule that uh, the Taliban um, instituted uh, a gender apartheid, which means the elimination of women from all aspects of livelihood, um, uh, restricting women in, in, in all from all public life and uh, subjecting women uh, to be uh, a subhuman uh, rather than a human. And also we have also witnessed the mass massacres of certain ethnic groups, political groups. Um, um, and this is just how the Taliban rule. Uh, the, the way they rule is to purge, um, to massacre, to bring fear and then rule. Um, there was nothing different that we saw in the Taliban in the last 20 years. Uh, with the presence of the international community and the Taliban were in the margins of the society and then they start bringing instability in in Afghanistan and that 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 led to that uh, that takeover that uh, that we witnessed last year um and 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 we know um from from what we are observing today of uh, uh, referenced back to it references back to the 1990s and uh, both for women and especially for uh, ethnic uh, vulnerable ethnic groups such as such as the Hazaras or political opponents um, that we are also seeing, uh, be it from any um, ethnic group, um, including those that belongs to the same ethnic group as as the Taliban. Um, but now. Um, it's it's just a, a, a repeated history, I think, a repeated history in a different in a pattern that is much more modernized, uh, much more sophisticated um, in, in the Taliban's threat, in the Taliban's uh, discrimination, in the Taliban's violence. Uh, but what has changed is the people of Afghanistan, um, the experiences that people had in the last 20 years the building of hope, the connection they had to the world, a new generation 
generation emerging with the promises that were made to them about, um, about uh, democratization, protection of their fundamental and basic human rights, and also their, uh, their, their, their dignity as, as people belonging to that geography, uh, to, to an Afghanistan that they could be hopeful that they could build and, uh, and break that, uh, that cycle of violence. But what impact it is having to the society? Um, the Taliban rule is having um, the, the policies that Taliban are implementing, um, uh, such as different forms of violence, is suffocating the population. It, it's not, it, it is the women, yes, it is the ethnic, vulnerable ethnic groups such as Hazars, but it's also the greater and the broader population. And everyone is uh, in a desperation for a way out. Um, uh, 40 million people cannot escape the country and um, and uh, people are showing different forms of resistance as we're witnessing. Um, there are military resistance, be it small or large, uh, but it is what they can do. There are uh, civil resistance. We're seeing women coming out and protesting um, uh, in, in, in tens, in twenties, in hundreds, um, in different parts of the cities um, across Afghanistan, using their voice uh, in addition the threat that they're facing because of the protest. Uh, we know about their abduction, their uh, imprisonment, and also the threat and blackmailing that their uh, family have been have been facing. But they're showing that resistance. Resistance. And, and we're also um, seeing a large um, group of um, people from Afghanistan escaping the country in legal and illegal ways. I mean, there are there in, in that suffocation I mentioned, they are in desperation to, de to, to get out. And this escalation um, uh, of, of insecurity in the country, unfortunately, might lead to, a, to another civil war that could be costly, not only for the people of Afghanistan, but also for the world, uh, bringing much more instability than the region is already experiencing, and also um, activation of uh, the many terrorist groups in the region, including their presence in Afghanistan, that the UN sanction uh, report or monitoring report has been, um, has been stating um, ev after every three months, I think, that there are some over 20 different terrorist organizations organization in big and small numbers um, active in the country and and they're not they're not national they're transnational um, groups that could use these spheres this anarchy this platform that the Taliban have provided or the Taliban rule have enabled them to uh, um, to escalate violence beyond the borders of Afghanistan and I think yeah the impact is really really critical and crucial and and this is also not surprising the way in which the international forces uh, decided to withdraw uh, from Afghanistan have led to this. We saw this coming. We have raised our red flags. We have raised our alarms. But unfortunately, uh, the decisions uh, were, 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 very, uh, were very political. They were made. And the consequences is here we are today. Great. Thank you for the very um, subtle but uh, sobering um, set of observations to, to frame our discussion. Thank you so much, Dr. Akhbari. Uh, Mehdi Hakimi, your, uh, the floor is yours, please. Thank you, Professor uh, Cruz, and thank you, Professor uh, Dr. Uh, Masumi and the wonderful colleagues at the South Asia Center and the Obasi Program for uh, organizing this, uh, this timely and important conversation. It's an honor to be here alongside Dr. Akhbari and Professor uh, Nizami. I think Dr. Akhbari did an, did an excellent job of uh, outlining uh, uh, the big picture and, and highlighting uh, some of the key issues. If I could just briefly perhaps reiterate uh, uh, and, and echo some of the, the, these points, I think history, as always, is very instructive in making sense in helping us making sense of uh, the multiple forms of violence uh, that we're seeing today. As, uh, as you mentioned, uh, a lot of the things that uh, we're seeing from the Taliban, notwithstanding what they claimed uh, uh, during the Doha process uh, should not really surprise us. Uh, the gender-based persecution that we're seeing vis-a-vis -vis Afghan women and girls uh, was a hallmark of their uh, policy uh, during the late 1990s. Uh, the atrocities that are happening uh, against Hazaras um, uh, are, of course, nothing new. It predates the Taliban. It predates um, uh, ISIS as, as, they, uh, as the, the group that they uh, now attribute 
with many of these attacks. But remember from the 1998 Mazar, uh, Mazar Sharif massacre, where between 2000 to 10,000 Hazaras were killed in a, in a span of a few days, uh, that the Taliban have uh, a deeply uh, uh, a, a, a deep animus vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, certain ethnic groups. Um, of course, uh, they've uh, ex uh, intensified uh, their attacks uh, this time in, in other ways. We're seeing the targeting of uh, Tajiks, uh, Panjshiris, and the Rabis. Uh, we're seeing um, the systematic force displacement of the Tajik and the Uzbeks uh, from places like Takhar and elsewhere. Uh, so uh, some of the uh, the things that we see should be uh, examined through that, that historical lens. I think it, it's also important to underscore at the outset, perhaps a somewhat uh, obvious point, but it, it's important to repeat because we keep seeing uh, the same mistake uh, uh, again and again, and that is the need to make a distinction between the words and the deeds uh, by the Taliban. During the, the Doha peace process, many people, including many so-called experts and think tanks, uh, believed perhaps genuinely that uh, the Taliban had really changed their ways and, and that influenced their advocacy on multiple fronts. Uh, unfortunately, we saw that you know they're one of perhaps the most important uh, promise uh, or pledge that the Taliban made to the uh, United States was that they won't allow Afghan soil uh, to be used by terrorists. We of course saw what they thought about uh, that pledge in, in in, in, in reality, as the Al Qaeda leader uh, was hosted and next to the presidential palace in Kabul uh, not that long ago. So it's very important to always judge the Taliban for, by their conduct and not what they uh, specifically uh, say. Another thing that might be helpful in making sense of some of the violence is to look at the ideological beliefs of the Taliban, which again can be manifested through their conduct. And that's the fact that this is a deeply ethno religious and misogynistic group. If you take a brief glance at the composition of the Taliban's cabinet, you see very clearly and very quickly uh, about uh, uh, that the what the Taliban think uh, with respect to the role of various ethnic groups uh, and, and women uh, in Afghanistan. There are no women uh, in, in the Taliban cabinet, there are no Hazaras, and the representation of the Tajiks and Uzbeks is also practically uh, non-existent. And of course, we're talking about a country that is deeply uh, diverse uh, and, and, and a pluralistic uh, society. Afghanistan, of course, once had a rich, once had a rich and vibrant community of Jews, Sikhs, and Hindus, and we've seen what's uh, unfortunately happened to these uh, communities. Uh, and this is, of course, notwithstanding the fact that Afghanistan uh, is a country of minorities in the sense that there is no particular ethnic group that comprises a majority. Yet, the overwhelming majority of the country is kept hostage by the Taliban. Uh, we've also seen uh, the Taliban's assault on, on certain cultural aspects of Afghan society, including their, their assault on the Farsi uh, or, or Dari language. And this is uh, seen through the removal of anything that, that is written in Farsi, for instance, from uh, logos, be it at universities, on, on streets, and public places. And that, again, uh, reflects the... Uh, uh, their, their, their animus and, and, and uh, intolerance vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, the pluralistic nature of uh, Afghan society. Uh, in terms of the effects of the, uh, the, the Talibanization, Talibanization of Afghanistan, as Dr. Akberi pointed out, I just want to reiterate the fact that Afghanistan is heading towards intense radicalization. We're seeing madrasas, these religious seminaries that promote things like uh, suicide bombing popping up everywhere. And this is a place Afghanistan during the past 20 years was a place that saw schools and, and, and girls going to schools as the, the, the predominant norm. Uh, but now that's being reversed. Girls, of course, are banned from school beyond uh, grade eight. Uh, women are banned from uh, public life uh, and the country is turned into a big prison for them essentially. Uh, but we're seeing a rise in fanaticism, this glorification of suicide bombings. Uh, and they're so brazen about it that they just go uh, boldly on social media uh, in, in terms of glorifying and advocating uh, for uh, this sort of fanatic uh, 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 ideology. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. I think I've uh, uh, sit, uh, surpassed my five minutes. Right. No, thank you. That, that was one for you. You managed to, to say a great deal in, in a very compact and efficient way. Thank you. That's really um, a very um, comprehensive landscape that you map out for us. Um, thank you. We'll look forward to hearing more in just a few moments. But um, it is uh, Professor Nazami's opportunity now to respond to our prompt. Thank you in advance. Uh, thank you so much, uh, 
Professor Cruz and, and Dr. Mushkan and uh, from the organizers of the um, program. It's a privilege to be here. I think Dr. Farhonda and both uh, Dr. Farhonda and Ustad Mehdi laid out the, the groundwork of, of the um, basic problem and, and how to make sense of the problem. I think two aspects of the conflict in Afghanistan has to has uh, needs specific consideration. Um, the fact that um, we recognize that the conflict in Afghanistan is an ethnic conflict compared to uh, classifying it as as any other uh, um, uh, conflict in the country. Taking a look back into the history of Afghanistan, which makes more sense to 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 our colleagues here, uh, taking a look into the um, origins of Taliban coming into power in 1990s and taking a look into how government, uh, uh, the, the, the previous government in Afghanistan, uh, 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 the policies uh, started in 2000, to, in, in 20, uh, um, 21, 20, uh, sorry, 21, in 2001, 2002, uh, 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 a, a drastic change in the government policies in 2000, around 2010, then a change that happened in 2014 which led to the chaos in 2018 and the and 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 uh, president ghani coming into power in the circle circle around president ghani and then of course uh, uh, coming taliban into power i think uh, the most important aspect of of taking a look into making sense of what's happening to other ethnic minorities in afghanistan other ethnic groups in afghanistan to the majority of the population of afghanistan is taking a look into afghanistan conflict from its uh, ethnic origin in which um, uh, one specific ethnic group and within that specific ethnic group uh, specific tribal groups uh, want to dominate the uh, the power, and they 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 are using literally any means that's possible and any means that's taking uh, for this group to be in power uh, to uh, um, suppress the rights of other ethnic minorities and uh, to to propagate and and continue their agenda. Of course, it has to do with 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 ethnic narcissism and 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 ethnic nationalism ideology within the country, which unfortunately a lot of leaders in Afghanistan, both within the Pashtun uh, 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 group, uh, but, uh, tribe, um, ethnic group within within Tajik, within Hazaras, within Uzbeks, um, a lot of politicians unfortunately have uh, have uh, the same uh, sort of mentality and view towards power in Afghanistan. Um, uh, even the previous government in Afghanistan, there was no uh, um, uh, uh, important and essential step towards state building in Afghanistan, unfortunately. And uh, uh, those who came into power during the, uh, the during the interim government, transitional government, uh, then during the time of Karzai, after Karzai, during Ghani, unfortunately, we were not committed to the uh, to the society to building a nation in Afghanistan. Um, although it, it could be taken a look from a different lens of how can you uh, establish a state in, in a um, South Asian country which, which has an, a, a different culture compared to the origins of, of nation state theory and in some countries that it has originated. But <clears throat> I think specifically taking a look into, into how, uh, how ethnic dominance in Afghanistan has played a role from early 90s. Uh, onwards when Taliban came into power, but of course it has existed for a long time, uh, for, for centuries now, uh, and uh, it gives us a clear idea of what's happening around other ethnic groups. Uh, they violate, they, they specifically the um, uh, 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 violence that exists in Afghanistan is not going to be uh, sort of limited to, to, other, to other ethnic minorities. It's definitely going to spread to, 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 to uh, uh, within, within Pashtun minority, unfortunately, as well. We have seen early examples of that happening in Kandahar when Taliban came into power, uh, even uh, when they hadn't seized the whole power in Afghanistan. Um, uh, we have been uh, sort of witnessing the same re restriction of power to two ethnic tribes within the Pashtun um, uh, in, in, in different provinces. Um, so it, it certainly is going to spread to that. Taking a look into how the pattern evolved from, uh, uh, from violence against the um, Hazara uh, group, then, then moving forward towards using the resistance as an as a as a sort of scapegoat uh, to have to start violence against um, Tajik, uh, um, uh, uh, Tajiks and and Panjshir and Andarab uh, 
we have been here we have been hearing of reports of uh, of sort of forced or displacement of people uh, uh we have been hearing reports of uh, um, of, uh forceful disappearance in in afghanistan um so i think that that is an important aspect of the conflict that we have to we have to take a look into in order to uh, to to sort of uh, uh have a clear clear idea of what's happening and what the the overall general agenda is going to look like in 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 a couple of years. In terms of the impacts that it's going to have on society, as as uh, both uh, uh, Ustad Mehdi and Dr. Farhonda pointed out, I think we are facing as uh, uh, we 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 are going to witness uh, in in four years and five years if Taliban make it to continue. I hope not, but if Taliban make it to continue, of course, we will be witnessing. Uh, uh, a wave of extremism and nationalism in Afghanistan, a wave of ethnic hatred um, uh, uh, against Pashtuns. Unfortunately, we are all we are already witnessing uh, uh, other ethnic groups uh, uh, um, uh, sort of developing this ethnic hatred towards Pashtun in Afghanistan, and um, specifically, that's that that that's going to be too much concerning in post-Taliban regime. Uh, whatever it's going to be, of course, the 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 uh, um, uh, uh, future is not too uh, too too clear for us whether it's going to be a government that's going to be established Taliban losing much of their power then staying in control in specific places places or a full full fledged civil war which seems to be the most unfortunate scenario in any of these cases I think there is going to be a a, a, a raise in ethnic uh, hatred against Pashtuns. Mm -hmm. Uh, we did uh, uh, witness some of these hatred taking place when Taliban uh, fell early in, in early 2000. Same thing is going to happen. The, the, the problem with, with the, uh, the, the basic ethnocentric policy and, and tribal dominance, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think, is the ideology of certain uh, so-called political elites <laughs> of, 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 of Pashtun, both technocrat and the Taliban. But of course, it's impacting the general population of Pashtuns and, and definitely other ethnic groups in Afghanistan. Uh, at the same time, I think, as Ustad Mehdi pointed out, uh, a, a big raise in, 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 uh, in extremism in Afghanistan. Of course, other groups, other uh, uh, um, uh, extremist groups are finding place, safe havens in Afghanistan to survive, to, uh, to uh, sort of uh, recruit uh, their fighters, their followers. Taliban themselves are going to change. The, there are steps to changing curriculum uh, in Ministry of Education for schools, changing curriculum in Ministry of Higher Education. And uh, um, I've taught at Kabul University. I'm still in touch with with students from from the Kabul University. Uh, when you talk to students, the level of of, of uh, 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 changes that they are witnessing. And uh, not specifically the curriculum at the moment, but the modules and uh, and course content and specific courses that uh, seem to be developing the Taliban ideology and interpretation that Taliban have of Sharia principles, uh, 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 which is indeed flawed and and and, and problematic. Um, so it's uh, I think it's still too short term uh, to to predict what's going to happen, but definitely it's going to be it's going to be. Be chaotic. It's going to be uh, destroying uh, in next four or five years if Taliban manage to 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 have power completely or or or, or uh, within specific areas in Afghanistan. Uh, more uh, more deprivation from from education, uh, more suppression of the ethnic group, including Pashtuns, uh, a rise in extremism, safe haven for extremist group and and international terrorism activities. Unfortunately. Thank you very much, Professor Nazami, for for putting this all together with such such clarity and learning. And thank I my thanks to the three of you. And um, Dr. Masumi, you have the floor now for our, our second question, if you will, please. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Thank you all so much. Um, so this the second question we have is sort of um trying to understand um the kinds of activism that are happening right now, particularly in social media outlets. So activists representing one of the key communities who have faced persecution under the Taliban 
and as our panelists have also distilled, and, uh, and with other Afghan rulers as well, the Hazaras have led a digital campaign with the hashtag Stop Hazara Genocide. Tajik activists, though perhaps to a lesser extent, have also made an argument for understanding anti-Tajik and anti-Painshidi killings in particular as genocide. And looking beyond ethnicity and religious difference, women's rights activists have condemned Taliban policies as gender apartheid. What do we gain from framing such violence as genocide and as apartheid? Are these the essential key words to illuminate what's happening now? Or are there alternatives? And Dr. Akbari, we can start with you. Thank you, Dr. Masumi, for the uh, very, very critical question. Um, I think reflecting back what has been discussed so far and how these terms come to form and come to become live, um, there is a history of both genocide and gender apartheid in Afghanistan, perpetuated especially by the Taliban, and there are extensive and uh, systematic violence, um, uh, such as massacre, forced displacement, targeted killing against the Hazara community, that looking at the definition amounts to genocide and also the installation of policies, discrimination against women and girls can constitute uh, what, what is known as, as, as an apartheid. But why this framing? Why genocide? Um, the word genocide uh, itself, I mean, uh, we know it, um, coined by um, Raphael uh, Lemkin in the 1944 to frame the Holocaust and the creation of, led to the creation of the Convention on Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide in 1948. And what genocide mean, I think it, it's, it, it's important to look back at that definition and how the Hazara community come from the grassroots to say that what is happening to the Hazaras in Afghanistan is or amounts uh, to genocide. And um, looking at the definition, genocide means uh, and any any of the of the acts committed uh, with an intention to destroy uh, in whole or in part a national eth eth ethnical, racial, or religious group. And this includes killing members of the group, causing serious bodily or mental harm to the members of the group, or deliberately inflicting um, on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, and imposing measures intended to prevent birth within the group, or forcibly transferring um, children of the group or another group. This definition is wide, uh, which is in the convention, and but the next article of the of 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 the uh, of the convention highlights that perpetrator are of the genocide is is not only those who commit the genocide, but also those who intends to commit any of the five elements that I have just uh, mentioned and is included in the definitions. Hazaras, as highlighted so far in our talks here, have a history of genocide uh, coming from the 1980s and uh, 1880s, um, 130 years ago under the rule of Emir Abdurrahman Khan. There has been a slow burning of genocide and intensified differently under different regime that came to power, but they have always targeted the Hazara communities in different ways. The kind of violence committed, the, uh, it, it could be characterized within that, uh, that, def uh, that definition, both in the historical context and also in the, in the current context. We know the genocidal genocide watch and the Holocaust Museum have been issuing alerts. And there are experts on the on the field about the the, uh, the 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 threats of genocide in Afghanistan, um, particularly on the Hazara community. And we have also seen um, that whichever forms of violence that takes place, be it under the Taliban rule or in the last 20 years uh, where this unknown sort of terrorist uh, uh, went on and, and hunted down uh, members of, of the miners or passengers traveling on a road 
to look particularly for the Hazaras and, and looking that and asking, and this has been recorded that who is the Hazara in this group and whoever were there, they were being shot and killed. Uh, it, it included women and it included uh, children as young as um, uh, nine year old and, and also elderly people. Um, and this this has been repeatedly happening um, in different forms. It was in, in, the, in the education centers. It, we remember the maternity hospital attack that uh, wounded and killed babies including mothers who were giving birth. We know the miners of the uh, Hazara miners in Northern province and, and, and so many uh, episodes. There has been hundreds of um, those incidents that uh, tourists were looking particularly for the community. And it itself um, qualifies that definition that uh, I already mentioned that a particular community is being targeted to, to destroy in whole or in part. Dashtabarchi is a very small area in west of Kabul, those of us who have been to Kabul. The community have been facing almost in monthly, weekly basis of these kind of attacks, suicide attacks. And, and the target has been specifically to the mostly to the younger generation to kill the hope, to give the message that you do not have a place in this country in the future, because the Hazaras have been opening their arms and um, uh, practicing this uh, so-called promises that were made in the last 20 years about democratization, about um, uh, changing uh, uh, Afghanistan or bringing Afghanistan out of this vicious uh, cycle of violence and changing their historical role as inferior, as the subordinate, as the juali, as the um, as the as the slaves um, that they were uh, being treated and considered in the country. And then coming back to gender apartheid, why gender apartheid? Um, women under the Taliban rule uh, have been experiencing um, different forms of discrimination based specifically on their gender. This is beyond their ethnicity. It's, it, it, it's all women, be it Pashtun, Tajik, Hazaras, Uzbeks, or, or other, other ethnic groups. Um, and this form of exclusiveness that the Taliban policies have been implementing and, and ruling subjugates women to become a subhuman and inferior and an entity that has no agency and and this has no religious or cultural justification we know we we lived in afghanistan and and, and those of us who have been working on afghanistan this has no justification um of either of it um but the the the, the, the thing that has been very much politicized about these terms of of gender um, discrimination or the violence against Hazaras or the politicide against um, and, and the Tajik or other eth ethnic groups who differentiate their opinion to the Taliban. They're being very much politicized by the international community. Um, the gender apartheid is specifically, um, we look back at uh, the racial apartheid, uh, the convention on racial apartheid, that how it criminalized apartheid, that is not the same for gender, for, 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 for the similar forms of violence conducted uh, based on gender uh, and, and the only international instruments that exist. Um, I think one that I could call is the Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, the CEDAW, um, which is rigid form, uh, rigid form of segregation of, of or, or other forms of harmful discrimination against women, but it only condemns and it does not criminalize as it does to gender apartheid. And these terms, genocide or gender apartheid, comes from the grassroots. It comes from the Afghan people themselves, that they frame it this way because international community is playing, is being political about these terms when it comes to Afghanistan. Um, if you categorize and, and, and see how how women are being treated in Afghanistan under the Taliban rule and the convention that exists in, internationally about condemning or preventing and punishing violence against women is very much also politicized and related to the international patriarchy because um, we know um, the male domination of, of international politics and how and how uh, 
uh, uh, uh, uh, discrimination against women is taken a lot more lightly than what we know uh, similar crime, crimes such as such as apartheid and the convention that exists which criminalized it and genocide itself um, history shows it's it's a polit it's very very much politicized it depends on geopolitics and the recognition of it depends on on uh, how how the international community sort of navigate uh, itself or positions its Itself, um, uh, uh, and and how would they uh, benefit or harm from 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 termings in, in such a way? Both terms come from the Afghan people, from the people of Afghanistan, from the grassroots, and and this is why we are talking about this today. This happened before, at least in the last thirty years, but it, it is only now with the activism, with the voices raised in the grassroots level that brought these terms and showing it to the international community, to the responsible authorities that what you're doing in this country or what you're committing is this, categorizing it, and then this. And, and we do know that there is a cycle of violence in Afghanistan. There is a routine violence. Every, there is a suicide bombing and everybody gets killed. But in addition to that, there are another layer that impacts a particular ethnic group includes or uh, impacts a particular um, gender identity. And I think this is out of desperation. And, and, and it took many, many lives, many, many lives, both be it a woman in Afghanistan or the Hazari community or other communities to come with this term and then bring it to their, um, highlight it to the international community because they did not want it to recognize it for the very uh, political reasons. Thank you so much, Dr. Akbari, and for starting us off with definitions here about the terms we're trying to understand and their efficacy in this context. Um, uh, Hakimi Saib, uh, uh, you're up on the floor. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Masumi. Uh, uh, Dr. Akbari, once again, did a pretty comprehensive job of uh, addressing this question, I believe. So um, uh, you know, what I'll do again is to echo and underline uh, some of the key, the key points that, uh, that she mentioned. There's always the tendency to, you know, when we're talking about genocide, uh, especially in this day and age, when, you know, in the, in the Ukrainian context, the word is being uh, thrown around, but it's important to understand the legal definition, because at the end of the day, of course, we can have a non-legal approach to the term. And Perhaps you know you could view the framing of these uh, discussions through these lenses, be it gender apartheid or uh, genocide, as uh, it, you know highlighting certain non-legal aspects. And that is, for instance, underscoring how dire the situation is and the urgent need to take action or to demonstrate exasperation and desperation for doing that, uh, for uh, taking uh, uh, meaningful action to address it. But from a strictly legal sense. The definition that uh, Dr. Akbari pointed out is uh, is spot on, but it, it I've seen it uh, multiple times on many occasions that people kind of are confused by certain aspects of, of the term. And so I, I will just highlight two uh, two of those potential sources of confusion when we talk about genocide. Uh, one part is that you know there's this misperception that genocide is about killing an entire group, right? Be it an ethnic group, national, racial, uh, or religious. Uh, of course, that's not the case. The, the definition uh, makes clear that the intent to destroy part of a group is also genocide. And when we talk about the case of Hazaris, for instance, the relentless attacks that we've seen on Dashti Barchi, and while Dashti Barchi is an extremely dense and small area of Kabul, it's, ext uh, it's extremely dense and populated. Uh, again, in Afghanistan, we've never had a proper census done, so it's hard to uh, you know, make uh, claims about the relative size of different neighborhoods, but, you know, if, so maybe I shouldn't uh, throw out figures uh, out there, but I would just suffice and say that it's an extremely dense area. If you've been there, you know, there's only one road that goes uh, through uh, Deshti Barchi, and uh, it's just uh, extremely packed. But the fact that this one single place in the west of Kabul has been relentlessly attacked in so many different ways from maternity hospitals, newborn babies, pregnant mothers, two schools, right? Just a few weeks ago, school children were, school girls were killed at a, at a school that was attacked 
on the previous occasion, which was then called Ma'ud, to mosques, right, to sporting clubs, to public buses. You take a bus, you don't know if, you're, if the bus is going to be um, explored, is going to explode or not, uh, to factories and work sites, um, you, know, you name it, social gatherings, you know, cultural events. Uh, if you're a Hazara, you're going to be abducted on the road because you're Hazara. You know, you, you're a good prime target for uh, you know, being taken hostage and uh, being released for ransom or not. Uh, so, you know, when we talk about the in-part aspect of the definition of genocide, the fact that Dashti de Barchi itself has been relentlessly attacked, in my view, makes it an, an essential part of a group because in Afghan in, in Kabul, which is obviously uh, the capital of the country and extremely significant, the fact that you relentlessly target a prominent part of a city that is kind of identified as being a Hazara place, so relentlessly that that kind of goes uh, 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 some way in addressing the in part element of the crime of genocide. Uh, the other element that I think is, is important to highlight uh, because I've seen people uh, misinterpret it is the fact that genocide does not necessarily require the killing of members of group. Of course, that is the hallmark of it. You know, when we talk about Holocaust, when we talk about the Rwandan genocide, the Armenian genocide, you know, th that, those are uh, the images that, uh, that uh, uh, come up. But strictly speaking, in a legal sense, uh, killing is only one basis for the actus reus or the physical element of the crime of genocide. There are other bases for the physical element of the crime of genocide that if proven would also meet those uh, elemental requirements of the crime. And those are, as Dr. Akbari pointed out, causing serious bodily or mental harm. So you don't need to actually kill members of one of those protected groups. If you cause serious bodily mental harm with the intent to destroy in whole or in part that group, you're committing genocide. Another alternative basis for the commission of genocide is the infliction of conditions of life that are calculated to bring about its destruction in whole or in part. Now, this is again, a third alternative basis for the commission of genocide. And of course, there are two other bases that Dr. Ekberg pointed out. But again, the point is that genocide, when we talk about it, it's not about you know, the, the wiping out of the entire group, if you relentlessly attack part of a group and that's your intent, you don't need to actually carry out and accomplish that intent, right? That's a different issue. It's, it's the question of whether you have the intent to do so. That's the material uh, element of, uh, and of course, there's also the mens rea or the mental element, uh, the specific intent, which also needs to be uh, proven. Another uh, important relevant international crime uh, closely related to genocide that I think might be helpful in addressing the atrocities that are happening um, against these different ethnic groups and, and also women is also the crime against humanity uh, of persecution. So under the Rome statute, if you identify, if you target a particular group, including on the basis of gender, ge remember genocide does not include gender as one of the protected uh, uh, bases, but under the crime against humanity of uh, persecution, if you attack a group on the basis of their identity, then you're committing a crime against humanity. And I think that that is helpful in, in, in understanding uh, as the attacks on, 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 uh, on, on various uh, ethnic groups uh, uh, as well. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll uh, stop there. Thank you so much for that. Um... You know, I, I really appreciate some of the legal nuance you've given us here, as well as distilling some of the realities on the ground that can help us connect these definitions to actual actions taking place. Um, Professor Nizami, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much. I think uh, that uh, uh, both Stott Mehdi and Dr. Farhonda had a, 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 a um, very, um, fair elaboration of the crimes uh, of the crime of genocide i think uh, the specific importance of of uh, the movement towards uh, establishing and getting into international's attention into the crime of genocide 
and and uh, uh, and uh, and afford to establish that is important because of the establishment of universal jurisdiction. Uh, there is a fair amount of unfortunate uh, uh, um, culture of impunity in Afghanistan. We witnessed the immunity law of Afghanistan 2007 to 2010 which provided blanket immunity to uh, to perpetrators of, of war crimes and different types of other crimes uh, that were committed uh, before 2000 before 2001 in Afghanistan and room statute authority does not uh, uh, the jurisdiction of room does not uh, extend to beyond 2000 beyond the time that it was ratified by the Afghan government by the, uh, at that time so uh, you know literally the perpetrators of all these crimes went and uh, went and and punished uh, 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 and enjoyed blanket immunity uh, by the immunity law uh, that was ratified by the by, uh, endorsed by the by president uh, Karzai. I think this is a this is an important move to establish universal jurisdiction of uh, for international uh, uh, tribunals, or at least for other countries, which remains as a hope uh, for us. We know that perpetrators of these crimes uh, uh, at some point have been uh, um, uh, tried, uh, prosecuted, and tried in UK, and we witness uh, another perpetrator of these crimes uh, in in in. Uh, um, uh, Bodhok prison in, in the Mahbas Pulchakhi, who was presented, who was tried in one of the European countries. So I think it's important to, to bring uh, international communities attention to establishing uh, such, uh, uh, such, such, a, uh, such an international jurisdiction. Second point, as to the alternatives, I think genocide is one of the crimes that could define parts of the actions that are committed uh, uh, under the Taliban ruling by the Taliban or other groups, uh, but of course there are other alternatives to the to the to the uh, 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 to, to defining these actions. I think the uh, 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 the amount of actions that were committed uh, either directly by the Taliban or by other uh, uh, extremist groups such as ISK uh, is way more than specifically genocide. Of course, there is a fair amount of evidence to establish crime of genocide, perpetration of genocide, as Ustad Mehdi and Dr. Farhonda argued uh, uh, for, for crimes that are committed against uh, Hazara uh, in, in different areas in Afghanistan. But I think uh, 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 crimes against humanity would be a good alternative to take a look into. Yeah, all, so just in case, as a second uh, term of reference, if, if genocide is hard to establish, I think crimes against humanity is very easy to establish for, for different types of actions and forced disappearances, torture of civilians, uh, uh, policies against different uh, gender, groups, killing of, of resistance force fighters who are captivated, who are holding combat out of the combat, who are not able to continue fighting, who are injured. Um, uh, that, that's, that's one. Adding to that, I think there is a fair amount of evidence to establish non-international armed conflict uh, in, in Afghanistan. So taking a look back into uh, how, uh, how uh, 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 we can define a non-international armed conflict of, of course, taken from the additional protocol two of the Geneva Conventions and the precedent of, of international tribunals, such as uh, the, the Tribunal for Yugoslavia and for Rwanda, specifically ICTY, will be important to eliminate in defining the conflict status currently in Afghanistan as a non-international con armed conflict. Uh, uh, both in terms of intensity of war, both in terms of level of organization of, for, of forces, and also uh, the, the longevity, the, the prolonged uh, uh, conflict that resistance, resistance that's going on. Uh, so I think there is a fair, fair amount of evidence to establish war crimes. Uh, um, so uh, once a, a, a conflict is that established in a specific jurisdiction, uh, the crime does not need to be committed in a specific area where the conflict is going on. So the, uh, the, the, the uh, 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 war crime can be committed or, uh, in, in any, any other part of that country in which uh, a non-international armed conflict or an international armed conflict is established. Uh, I think that would be an easy way of establishing uh, uh, responsibility for, for perpetrators of these crimes. The privilege that war crimes would have, I think it's more easy to prove, it's more easy to establish, once of course we have established that there is a non-international armed conflict going on. 
Uh, and at the, at the same time, I think the, the, the scope of application of war crime is way more broader compared to other, uh, other uh, international crimes. It's in the jurisdiction of the ICC, of course, and, and universal, much established universal jurisdiction to it. Uh, so I think that uh, war crimes can be, and crimes against humanity can be another path to uh, make uh, 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 establishment of responsibility for perpetrators those, of these crimes, including those who provoke such crimes, including those who instigate such crimes, including those who, who, uh, who are aiders and abettors in a, uh, in a way for, for the crime of genocide, crimes against humanity. I think uh, 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 taking a look into, into crimes against humanity, which would be uh, committed if we establish that uh, Afghanistan is, is in peacetime, or if, uh, if we think that, uh, uh, if we establish a conflict, I think war crime will be another suitable uh, term to define actions that are happening in Afghanistan. Great, uh, thank you so much. So I think that, the most difficult question has, has come at the end here. And um, Mishkan, I'm not sure I how got, I got um, stuck asking this difficult one to challenge our, our, our guests uh, even further. We've all already given some sense of what is to be done, which I think is you know, the, the question that we're all wrestling with. Um, now that you've laid out so clearly with such learning and, and you know, lucidity, you know, what's at stake? How about this, uh, various, these various forms of violence are affecting Afghan society? You know, I think, of course, we're all wrestling with question, what is to be done? And I think you've offered us um, a kind of terminology, a kind of legal framing, which suggests certain avenues for uh, next steps forward. But, but if we step back for a moment, I mean, we're all academics here, but we're also all realists in a sense. I think you all have lived this. We've all been studying this. Um, we've seen how little traction the international community has actually gotten in trying to uh, restrain the Taliban, or if we bring, say, Islamic State course on province into the mix. We've also seen very little headway there uh, on the international stage. You know, Afghanistan's neighbors uh, don't want to do anything to limit any of these actors, it would seem. Uh, there are various letters of layers of very opaque uh, complicity across the region. And then globally, I think uh, Dr. Akbari's point about the, the kind of patriarchy of international institutions and, and interpretation of law is, is absolutely essential. Um, and also, if we zoom out to, I think, one of uh, Michelle's initial points about the the general climate of hostility toward asylum seekers, um, which is a kind of undermining of international law, an undermining of all the categories that that Mehdi um, Hakmi and Nasruddin Nazami highlighted for us. Um, and we can't really hope for a kind of immigration or migration, outward migration, as an escape route for Hazaras or for Panjshiris or, or for others, so not for, for women. Um, we've seen internet activism gain some traction and certainly raise awareness in important ways um, certainly, you know, the hashtag politics are, are important interventions. But in our remaining time, um, could you all reflect on, you know, really what is to be done with the, the multi uh, kind of faceted agenda? Um, how do we, as an international community, um, take action to protect communities under siege, uh, whether they are, you know, ethnic minorities um, and or disenfranchised women and girls? Um, you laid out a number of avenues, a number of paths, mostly in the legal realm, um, but looking at it from the perspective of the United States, which really either has not signed on to these conventions or has worked uh, for decades now to undermine them, uh, it seems we're left with a very limited uh, set of options and a, a very kind of narrow repertoire for taking action. So in the 12 minutes or so that remain, um, where should we focus our energies as a community who are concerned with you know, the present and future of Afghanistan coming at it from different perspectives? Um, where, where would you guide us in, in directing our focus now? So if we could proceed in the same order, uh, we'd be grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cruz. I think I gotta go on this one. Um, um, <clears throat> unfortunately, we're still on the first steps, which is awareness, recognition, and acknowledgement, uh, which could hopefully um, lead to accountability. Um, both in those two terms, apart, gender apartheid and, and, and the genocide of the Hazars, 
we are still trying to, as, as the people in Afghanistan or out of Afghanistan, try to frame it and bring to alert and awareness of the international community, the international um, international law about these two issues that uh, this is happening in this country and try to depoliticize it as much as we can. Secondly, there is a responsibility by foreign states and uh, in the international community who were involved in Afghanistan and the intervention that occurred in Afghanistan, which also in a way enabled the return of the Taliban, the, 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 the return of their, their um, uh, gender apartheid regime and also their discrimin discriminatory regime. Um, they have a responsibility and obligation. There's some 40 something country that were involved in the last 20 years and the way in which they withdraw the policies that they had towards uh, the, the so-called war and terror, um, they have a responsibility. They cannot just wash, wash off their hand and, and, and leave it as it was. Uh, because their intervention added certain layers of vulnerability, both to the women and also to um, ethnic groups in Afghanistan who signed up to those agendas, to human rights, to democracy, to um, uh, practicing those things in their grassroots community, which is now uh, they're being punished uh, for, the, for, the, for the same, for, the, for these um, being categorized as crime under the Taliban regime. And also, it's worth mentioning that uh, <clears throat> Afghanistan of, have always had an option between bad and the worse. We were told that you have to commit or you have to sign up to this peace deal that the US and the Taliban signed in Doha on 29th of February 2020. Otherwise, the, the Taliban will turn militarily. We were never given an option as the people in that country with uh, uh, who, who would have a voice and a power. We were never given um, those agency because of this foreign so-called foreign intervention and foreign influence. Uh, and for these reasons, I think international community need to um, take um, responsibility for the mess they created and the mess that they have left left behind and that the obligation they have for this particular categories of people, be it women or um, ethnic groups inside Afghanistan, uh, as a return of their policies that enabled the return of the Taliban and, and what could happen next, and, and they cannot turn a blind eye. And here it's the people that are pulling their leg that um, that, that you need to, to do what you can. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, there are international instruments and mechanisms in place. They're, of course, being very politicized. Uh, we know from history, but uh, it's time uh, for Afghanistan to, to be treated uh, for the dignity and for human rights of its people inside the country uh, and activate those those instruments, international instruments, in order to um, uh, prevent uh, uh, or punish uh, crimes uh, against mass atrocity crimes and crimes against um, um, uh, a gender apartheid that is in place. Um, otherwise, I think um, the result the result as we spoke in the first question, the impact that will have will not only um, make the people of Afghanistan suffer, but the consequences far greater, far richer. And here we do have um, the special human rights to put um, uh, in Afghanistan that his office needs a lot of support, be it political resources, financial, uh, who would be able to hold perpetrators accountable. Afghanistan in the last 43 years never had the perpetrators accountable. And now we need, the first step we need to do is acknowledge, recognize and hold perpetrators accountable. This is as simple as that, and unfortunately, as neglected as that, that um, they were not being accountable. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. You make a very, very compelling, very forceful case. Um, thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Hakimi, thank you. Uh, Dr. Akbari, once again, uh, did a fantastic job here. So excuse me for being redundant on, on some of these points. Uh, I think advocacy and raising public awareness globally are vital. Um, politicians and these different institutions are much more likely to respond meaningfully if their local constituents are mobilized and galvanized effectively. 
I think part of the success of the uh, the, the the Twitter uh, activism of the Stop Azar genocide campaign, which resulted in protests in, in around 100 cities on all five continents, uh, can be attributed to the fact that local constituents became more aware of the ongoing atrocities facing uh, Hazaras. But of course, these efforts need to continue and amplify documentation of crimes uh, is also very important. Effective advocacy, of course, relies on solid documentation. You cannot do reliable, credible advocacy if you lack those uh, essential facts and evidence. To that end, the media plays a vital role. I think the significance and role of the media is even uh, heightened by the fact that local media cannot be trusted because they're under the, the thumb of the Taliban. Uh, thankfully, technology allows uh, media outlets outside to be able to, to gather evidence and, and collection. We've already seen a growing body of evidence showing crimes by the Taliban uh, including summary execution of Tajiks. Uh, we were seeing Panjshiris being uh, plucked off the streets in broad daylight, uh, put in the trunks and, and delivered to unknown locations and then bodies uh, emerging from uh, uh, various places. We've seen the forced displacement of Uzbeks. Uh, and, and this is, a, I think, just the tip of the iceberg because as I said, the local media is, is pretty much, uh, cannot, it is operating under severe constraints as uh, uh, Ustad and Nizami pointed out, judicial action, formal investigations are paramount. Uh, Afghanistan has ratified the Rome Statute. The International Criminal Court has a legal obligation to commence the formal investigation that's been long overdue. Uh, and uh, it, it's got to start, the UN must aid in that process. Uh, as Dr. Akbari pointed out, holding the Taliban accountable, travel bans, sanctions, greater oversight over the flow of funds and humanitarian assistance. There are many reports of the Taliban plundering and diverting humanitarian assistance aimed for Hazaras and other vulnerable groups across Afghanistan. This needs to stop. And, and finally, and then this uh, uh, again uh, goes back to the point about asylum, but I think that uh, we can still make uh, design asylum determination systems in order to reflect the acute vulnerability of these groups, Hazaras, Tajiks, Panjshiris, Uzbeks, and women. These groups under have a very clear, well-founded fear of persecution, which is the definition of, of uh, what a refugee is. And so the refugee determination process must acknowledge and facilitate claims by these uh, vulnerable groups. We've seen some good steps by countries like Canada that have recently removed the requirement to obtain a refugee card in a third country in order to be eligible for overseas asylum applications. But we need more countries to, uh, to, to adopt similar measures. And of course, treating uh, asylum seekers equally, whether they're from Afghanistan or a place like Ukraine. Thanks so much. You're, you're reviving our, our faith in international institutions and law. So it's uh, quite a feat because I'm, I'm the worst of cynics when it comes to this, um, having watched this unfold. So I'm Newly energized, Mehdi, thank you so much. That's quite wonderful. Um, so we turn last to Professor Nazami. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. I'll be brief. I think in terms of uh, in terms of Afghan youth, it's important to, as uh, the, the efforts that's been continuing in terms of uh, um, uh, raising awareness and, and, and doing advocacy is, is key in order to, uh, to bring uh, international attention, international actors attention, institutions attention. Uh, at the same time, as much as possible, I think the youth uh, to get directly in touch with people who are left in Afghanistan, of, of course, those in Afghanistan do not enjoy the, uh, the, the privilege of life we have abroad. I think so both mental support, both uh, um, sort of educational support or, uh, or uh, financial support, if that's possible, would be so important, I think, to the people who are suffering from poverty in different times of, uh, similar to, to, to you, uh, Professor Albert Cruz, I have lost a, a degree of my hope to international institutions and international law generally. I think that that would be that would be one of the things that's important from an international community's perspective. I think uh, the doctrine of responsibility to protect R two P is an, interna an an important and interesting concept to take a look into in the case of Afghanistan at this time. Uh, 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 state's responsibility to protect citizens against crime of genocide, crime war crimes, crimes against humanity, all other types of uh, 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 these actions and international communities' responsibility to assist a state in, 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 uh, in, in uh, uh, avoiding and protecting its uh, responsibility. And at the end, if, if that was not possible, of course, a way to bring a collective security measure to make sure that the citizens of a specific country are protected within the borders of the country. 
to that country. I think R2P is an interesting doctrine to take a look into if, if, if we are not pro humanitarian intervention. I believe humanitarian intervention is one way to establish international communities engagement into, into the conflict in Afghanistan. If, if that, that seems to be sort of and un, un, uh, un, un documented in doctrine, R2P I think is, is a well-established doctrine at least for the moment and the international law. At the same time, as, as both Sot Mehdi and, and Dr. Falhonda uh, uh, mentioned, I think uh, it's, it's a good time to uh, establish our faith and promise again on establishing uh, accountability. Uh, the Taliban have uh, have inherited uh, 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 long history of impunity in Afghanistan uh, from different people who came into power, and there is no doubt that within the group, they they uh, with the mindset, they they have an understanding that even after 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 the regime uh, is going to uh, going to not going to be there anymore there is going to be a sort of uh, um, uh, understanding or a sort of um, uh, structure that would bar any type of responsibility to establish against them. I think international community can take firm actions, uh, sending special rapporteur to Afghanistan, to Panjshir, is a good example. I think uh, uh, we need to see how accessible evidence gathering and talking to different groups in Afghanistan is possible to the special rapporteur, but uh, doing taking a firm action after a report has been submitted, we have reports of Human Rights Watch. We have reports of different international actors. Uh, we have reports. Uh, uh, we, we are going to have reports of this rapporteur. I think a, a way to establish uh, uh, responsibility and accountability for perpetrators, for aiders and abettors, for invokers and instigators of these crimes are, are important steps that international community can take. Great. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, Mishkan, do you want to? Take the last word. We're, I think, unfortunately, I think we're out of time. Um, do you want to? Yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I I just want to thank our our panelists so very much. There there are a number of wonderful questions that have come in through our Q and A, and unfortunately, we are out of time. And I I I feel regretful that we can't get to those questions. But I will I'll try to share them with our panelists. Um, uh, uh, post post uh, ending today's session. But once again, um, I've learned a great deal and I really appreciate the contextualization that has taken place here um, within these conversations, um, the legal aspects um, and, and, and really trying to shed more clarity um, on, um, on quite a situation that we're, we're looking at in the country now. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, if I can make echo Mishkan, I mean, you've given us so much to think about, um, so much clarity, and I think really inspiration for, for going forward. I think um, one major contribution you offered all of us is to, to think in a wide range of ways, much wider than I've imagined, about possible avenues forward. Um, locally, as Mindy mentioned, with protests, with working with politicians at the level of international law and courts, um, Really, the, the gender dimension comes through very clearly and is something that is um, widely applicable, I think, beyond Afghanistan as well. So I think that the, the lessons you've offered us here today are really um, broadly useful for thinking about global politics today. And uh, we're really grateful and I hope we can do something like this again. Unfortunately, I think we're gonna be wrestling with these challenges um, for some time and um, we're so lucky to have your guidance and are really, really thankful. Uh, thank you so much for having us. Thank you, great. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Take care.